All right. Joining us now is Sean Jacobs. He's an associate professor of international affairs at the New School and founder and editor of Africa is a Country. Sean, thank you so much for joining us. I should call you Professor Jacobs, actually. Uh, so Sean is OK. <laughs> um, all right. So I'm so happy that you're here with us. I have so many questions to ask you, um, especially with the uh, Black Lives Matter movement that's happening here in the United States, but also globally, we're seeing um, protests in, in response to policing in various countries. And I think that's that's important. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit first about why you think the Black Lives Matter protests uh, spread across the world. I mean, I think firstly, so I'm thinking particularly from the perspective of, you know, someone who's from like Africa or specifically South Africa, I think we underestimate the the, the power of U.S. cultural politics. Um, so, you know, what, this, this is sort of common sense, right? The influence of Hollywood, the ubiquity of American media, um, that large parts of the world sort of even if they know that there's a particularity to American politics around race, they sort of, it's its a—it's both a kind of aspirational politics and something they can identify because of movies, because of television. So that's one thing. I also think that a, a lot of American radical politics, particularly African-American politics have always been, you know, Malcolm X. I mean, you know, I, I actually think Malcolm X way more than Martin Luther King because of his appeals to like the UN or the kind of politics that went with that. And then I think the internet is obviously like the big thing, which is, and there's a piece on our website um, by Will Shoki, who's a young South African writer, lives in Johannesburg, um, that writes about like why, you know, one is, as I said, this idea that like, we all are watching kind of America. Secondly, there's, there's definitely the impact of social media, that people look at social media. And I think it's also fascinating that normally because America is, well, the United States, because, you know, it's a continent and then a country, the U.S. is seen as often exceptional. A lot of people never really thought of the U.S. as something that they could look to and identify for, for I would say, radical politics or more progressive politics. Um, but in this instance, um, it felt like the U.S. was the place in which people sort of finally took on the police. So, yeah, there's, this, there's similar kind of problems around the police in the average African country. I, there's a statistics like in Kenya, the police murdered uh, something like 144 people last year. It's only June and they've murdered already something like nearly 95 people. So they're on course to break that record for the year. So some of the same issues happen in these different countries. They, they manifest differently. So in Kenya, the police is black. The police is not white in South Africa. The police commissioner is black. Most of the, the police force are black. But some of the same methods are being employed and these are they're for various reasons they inherited from colonialism but i think more pointedly some of the methods that all these police use they get training from the americans and so i think people began to see these connections they began to identify with and i think also one other quick point is the presence of various diasporas particularly in europe uh, in britain um, african uh, people of african descent people from the caribbean um, black britain collectively as black Britons in France, where there's like a long struggle by people without papers, uh, where there's like systematic racism by the police against people who live in like, you know, lower income neighborhoods on the outskirts of like the big cities. So I think this moment just presented an opportunity for people with various different grievances. And that meant it manifested itself, you know, differently. One other quick example, in some countries, it wasn't necessarily police brutality, but it was about public monuments. You see, you know, in Belgium, it was about getting rid of like monuments dedicated to Le King Leopold II, who was responsible for what essentially amounted to a genocide in the old Congo. Uh, in Britain, like they threw like statues of people associated with with slavery. So, so, so it was just because of that connection between mass media, uh, the internet, I would say, this kind of relationship that people have with American popular culture. Um, and especially, it, it, it's, it's often radical culture or culture dressed up as radical. It, it just, it resonates um, around the world, yeah. Yeah, Sean, I wanna follow up on that with uh, maybe the you know very good potential of the dynamic you're outlining and maybe some of the downside of it. And so 
So one thing, and, and Alex Huckley has a piece in Damage where he sort of does a very interesting critique of this as basically American soft power uh, getting exported globally. And I think, I mean, I think in some ways he really overstates it, but he has some kind of interesting examples of, you know, places where say like Roma are abused by police uh, and that isn't discussed, but then like the exact replication of language um, in a situation that you know, applies to Chicago or New York um, is sort of, you know, imported and replicated. And then, you know, another example, an unfortunate example would be, uh, you know, like this this kind of, and now it's sort of everybody's on the bandwagon of trashing this book, so I'll do it a lot less, but this kind of, you know, this white fragility stuff, now we've got to translate these terms from just sort of like, you know, kind of corporate training seminars in Europe. Now, that might be the, the sort of downside of, of this kind of export of a certain type of neoliberal kind of identitarian sort of thing. Um, now, on the other hand, what I'm actually curious about, if these do become properly global um, in, the, in the really inspiring way they are, um, at, there, there are global uprisings against racism, against white supremacy, against police violence, and all of the issues that those think into. And I'm, and I'm actually thinking of a piece that William uh, Shockey wrote for your site about uh, called The Class Character of Police Violence, where he sort of talks about the post-liberation policing in South Africa. And what struck me was that, and, and again, I guess, one, the paradox of, of leaders like Cyril Ramaphosa, who has his own direct relationship, you know, in the Maracana massacre, which maybe you could talk about, uh, using this to sort of burnish domestic credentials. But then on the other hand, what if this did become properly globally reciprocal, that Americans could start reading William's piece could start, you know, contextualizing in a way that we really do see the global dimension and, you know, therefore the capitalist dimension of it. Right. So, so I think there's like three parts to yes, there's well, there's a, places that I could maybe say something useful. One is I think about um, how glo right, you know, so how 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 reciprocal is 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 this relationship between what's happening in the U.S. and are, are Americans taking on ideas from other parts of the world? I think the other one is about the class character. The first is I, I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of answer you the first part of your question by I actually think that um, we we underestimate like the 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 impact. Well, let me let me say occupy. If we if we take it back a little bit, so in most of these African states, South Africa is probably unique because it's kind of the last sort of left wing uh, or movement that is broadly left wing that gains political power. It gets into power, but then it slides back into a kind of, you know, a sort of globally accepted neoliberal model. Now, the, we could debate the various reasons for it as to why it does that. It might have to do with local conditions because it's trying to placate and and um, make sure that whites, right, take a buy-in into this new order. So Nelson Mandela's kind of posture is mostly that of reconciliation. The other is that, like, the world conditions at this at this at that point forces them to to take a neoliberal model. Like Mandela goes to Davos, they tell him, he's like, I'm gonna nationalize stuff. They tell him, you can't do it. So in a, in, in a lot of these places, they become sort of straitjacketed by like a global consensus. And, but the effects for the people who live there is mostly negative, right? It's, it's unemployment, it's underemployment, um, it's lack of investment in social services. And when it comes to the police, it's basically the same like the police elsewhere. But if, if, if you know much of what I know is what's happening on the African continent, I think Occupy is like the first moment in which people there, and and, and I this is why I think the uh, uh, when when you sort of say like how much of what we see in America is is what what is it that that we can see in America and can we replicate it? Is it helpful to us or whatever? So if you're living in some other part of the world, and there is this movement that begins in the United States that explicitly identifies the problem of one of the failures of capitalism in very crude ways, the 1% against the rest, but people can like catch up to that. So you saw, you saw similar kinds of movements in African countries, in Nigeria, I think in 2011 or 2012, there's something called Occupy Nigeria. It's about a very specific thing, which is that the state guarantees people a, a um, what they call like, a, 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 people who call it gas, but you know, like a subsidy, 
And the government is corrupt. People don't see anything from the state, but they sort of, they want that subsidy, that oil subsidy. Um, and so they form a movement called Occupy Nigeria. And you see similar kind of movements develop in South Africa, I think. It's still mostly around what they call service delivery, like um, uh, free water, free water up to a point, not to privatize electricity, uh, evictions. So that's the kind of politics. So I think it was sort of just like that for a while. What we forget is like Bernie Sanders has like, a, I mean, just from what my sense was, the, the, he invigorated like the American left. He was probably not going to win. I saw Adolf said the other day, he wasn't probably going to win the election, but he invigorated like the left here. Um, and they, and I think somebody else said like, we won the argument, but we didn't win, you know, we didn't have the numbers. So I think some of the ideas that Bernie made here, if you go back, there's an old article that I wrote on the site, which is that you saw um, African immigrants in Britain um, saying like, the things that Bernie Sanders identified are the things that we identified. There was something called Africans for Bernie. Uh, they were in South Africa, in, in African countries. Um, people wondered whether or not they could get a Bernie Sanders, like a leader like Bernie Sanders. So they weren't like necessarily, yes, he's like an old white man, but that wasn't the thing that they connected to. It right. was what his ideas were. So there's, a, there, there's some, because of this way that American ideas spread, but in this case, I think it's like, now it's like a particular set of American ideas. Ocasio-Cortez is also a kind of uh, a version of it. I also think Ilan Omar is the most exciting African politician there is right now in the way that she identifies what is wrong with American imperialism. You don't hear this kind of thing from the average African politician or that they would do these kind of things when they, when they have power and they can use it to change policy. So when I say like this, I mean, if I sort of have to be more specific about what I said first, it's that what I think is interesting that's coming out of the US, that kind of energy. And one last point is on this one, I think Black Lives Matter this time around is a very different movement. I think people underestimate that this is not the Black, Black Lives Matter of 2013. The Black Lives Matter of 2013 was you know, anger. I think it then became, a, it, it then became you know, very much about black politics, black identity politics, black power politics. This is something else. I mean, like, you know, I live in New York City, I live in Brooklyn. This is a multiracial coalition. It's multi-generational. Uh, it, 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 I don't think it's maybe not yet. It's not captured because, you know, we're, we're in like the standoff. So it, uh, it's, it's in motion. So I'm also probably projecting onto it. But I don't think it's been captured by any sort of NGO politics or, you know, there's good foundations and there's bad foundations. But what people use it for, it's like foundation politics. It's very much like it's, it's open-ended. It's very, very radical. It can go everywhere. And interestingly, it also uh, has popularized a whole bunch of ideas that we didn't think were like regular, say like a month ago, defund the police. And maybe it could also it could also be like the thing that extends that argument, that takes it somewhere else, right? That people extend it to like uh, social services, et cetera, and so on. On the second thing about the class character, just quickly, the class character of politics um, in South Africa, in places like South Africa. So in, in places like South Africa, it happens that the, 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 the police inherited many of the methods from apartheid. Um, and what black South Africans of, of who are middle class don't often like make a connection is that the police are obviously not often attacking them, but it's going for working class people in South Africa. So those are those are the differences I think that William addressed in his, and I, I could come back if you want me um, to this. On the reciprocal question quickly, because I know I'm sort of droning on. On the reciprocal question, I think there, the point is like, I'm not so optimistic that Americans are learning a lot from other places. I was talking to someone the other day about um, some of the movements, just from my experience in South Africa. I, I think it would be fascinating for Americans to go look back at at say like something like the United Democratic Front, which was a very populous movement in the in the 1980s, that happened in South Africa after the 1970s, which was very explicit like black consciousness politics, and out of that something else had to come, which was like cross class, cross racial, uh, cross racial, and it will be interesting for me if Americans go look at the example of you know what people did with with uh, Black Lives Matter, also sorry with 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 the United Democratic uh, Front in South Africa. Um, so, you know, there's, 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 I, I, I'm not, I'm not confident that the people in the U.S., uh, uh, maybe not people on this program, but, you know, 
can see those connections and go like, hey, there's something we can learn from other places. Aside from maybe, oh, this is how you protect yourself. Hong Kong said use, people used umbrellas. But I think at a more substantive level, like in terms of like ideas about how to think about um, the United States as an imperial power, how to think about your place in it, how to think about public policy, no. I'm a little bit more pessimistic about that.